Thank you very much, John, and uh, many thanks for this opportunity to talk this afternoon. Um, so why are standards important? As we know, history is important in determining and shaping action. I, like a number of people here today, began my humanitarian career in the 1990s, one of the most stark and devastating periods in humanitarian on our global human history. In 1990 to 92, working through the Somalia civil war and food crisis, in Baidoa, where I and many others working alongside a proud and wonderful people struggled to deliver aid and stem the huge loss of life within an environment of insecurity. The horror of the Bosnia war between 92 and 95 and the devastating tragedy that unfolded in Central Europe. Then Rwanda 94, where the most appalling genocide was perpetrated and the international community failed to intervene. The ensuing refugee crisis and cholera outbreak which shook the humanitarian community to its core. A call for change, it was at this time in the early 90s that brought about the great call for change and a new accountability, putting people and communities firmly at the center of all we do and giving them voice. Over the past two decades, we've seen the creation of the Sphere Standards and Humanitarian Charter, a new way for humanitarian action linking international law, principles, and a means to deliver programs systematically. People in aid creating a professional standard to ensure those who deliver aid are professionally supported and managed. With HAP, the creation of a standard to ensure accountability to crisis-affected communities, a framework to oversee accountability, and putting the voice of disaster-affected people at the centre of what we do. While this was an agenda for professionalisation, creating rigour and change, it has also been about the shifting of power turning the tables and us listening to the people we serve, men, women, children, the elderly and vulnerable, and working for greater equity. The challenges in Syria today, this minute, mirror many of the examples I have given. Has the humanitarian system changed for the better? I would say without question, yes, but much more still needs to be done. So what is the Joint Standards Initiative? This is a really exciting collaboration between three standards bodies, the Humanitarian Accountability Partnership, HAP, People in Aid and the SPHERE Project, to set out and explore how and the wider standards movement can become more coherent. The three initiatives believe that greater coherence will improve the use of standards and that this in turn will improve the quality and accountability of humanitarian action and most importantly, the impact on people's lives, which is central. The Joint Standards Initiative is ultimately about contributing to a standard system which is more straightforward to users and agencies. At the outset, we're hearing that standards need to be robust and comprehensive, yet simple and user-friendly. Coherent, easy-to-use standards are more likely to be put into practice and hence to make a difference in the lives of conflict and disaster affected people. So why is coherence necessary? As I mentioned previously, previously, over the last 20 years, the humanitarian sector has grown into a multi-billion dollar enterprise and consequently has become increasingly professionalized. With this has come the creation of a variety of standards and accountability mechanisms to ensure that the humanitarian assistance is high quality. Whilst the early 1990s saw an absence of standards, the current situation may pose the, op the opposite problem, with over 100 standards initiatives now in existence in the humanitarian sector. Field workers and others have experienced a challenge in combining and implementing the number of standards in an efficient, comp complementary and effective way. We started the JSI process by commissioning a mapping exercise last autumn to complement work previously done by HAP in 2007 and found that there are over 100 different Q&A initiatives at present. Even this doesn't give a complete picture, but it demonstrates to us all that to the average aid worker who is increasingly from the South, there was a wide variety of standards and initiatives to understand and adopt. In a sector characterized by high turnover, the need to rapidly train new staff in the wake of disasters and a wide variety of agencies from small community-based organizations to enormous federal networks makes it difficult to reliably and consistently apply the main standards. 
So in response to the perceived confusion, the lack of awareness and inconsistent application of standards, the three initiative launched the JSI process. So how did we go about the JSI inquiry? At the heart of the JSI process was a global stakeholder consultation designed to be a bottom-up evidence-based inquiry with no pre predetermined outcome and aiming to be wide-ranging, objective and representative of our sector. Many of you will have participated in the consultation, which, as you may recall, focused on four key th thematic areas, the use and accessibility of standards, their implementation, compliance and veri verification mechanisms, and future needs of standards users. <coughs> Between December 2012 and th March 13, the consultation team spoke with over 2,000 people from field practitioners to affected people to HQ staff in 114 countries representing three un 350 organisations with a variety of approaches, online survey, focus group discussions, one-to-one -one interviews, regional events in hubs and our Copenhagen conference. Lois Austin and Glenn O'Neill, the independent consultants running the consultation, said that they are confident that the resu resultant findings represent a robust and representative view of our humanitarian sector. We, an we had an expert and dedicated advisory group with two independent co-chairs supporting the JSI over the last nine months, providing oversight, integrity to the consultation pro process, as well as using consultation findings and the recommendations to come up with their own recommendations to the three boards. As I mentioned earlier, I am part of the steering group made up of the board chairs, directors from the three initiatives, plus the JSI coordinator, who have been responsible for driving the inquiry forward. First slide, please. So what did our stakeholders say? So I'll just touch on a number of these points now. Standards are well known and used by a high majority of traditional international humanitarian actors through further awareness raising and training needed. Awareness of standards is significantly lower amongst national and smaller NGOs compared to larger NGOs, UN or International Red Cross, Red Crescent Movement. Okay. I think that's not the right slide. Oh. Is it the previous slide? Is it the previous slide, sorry. Um, <laughs> language and terminology hinder access to standards compounded by a lack of common terminology and structure within the text of the three standards. Implementation <coughs> of standards, lack of knowledge and inadequate training are the main barriers to the implementation of the standards. Lack of systematic presence and uniform su support from the QNA initiatives impedes implementation. Then moving on to verification and compliance of standards, no clear consensus on the best approach for verifying compliance, internal versus external, although mandatory <coughs> favoured over voluntary, the majority in favour of verification systems that consist of different levels to inspire, and then fourth, future views on humanitarian sta standards, broad consensus for action on greater awareness, dissemination and training, harmonisation and consolidation of standards with a focus on harmonising texts and avoiding overlaps. And then finally, including affected people at the centre of standards. So on the 16th of May, um, there was a joint um, board um, and decisions were made. Initial proposal was agreed on uh, one month ago in Geneva as a crucial meeting of the three boards of HAP, People in Aid and Sphere where they jointly committed to the following three things. Deliver a verifiable common core standard by the end of March. Provide joint awareness raising and sp support activities around the standards. And collaborate with other actors to develop a new standards architecture. This is a really significant achievement to have this common agreement to what standards coherence looks like and the broad direction of travel set for a process to implement these decisions over the next 21 months. So what we've committed to is a new standards project. So this in many ways is the end of the JSI or Joint Standards Initiative 
and the Moving Forwards to Create the Standards Project, which will run from July 2013 to March 2015, with four key, key work streams. The first being a humanitarian core standard to facilitate the development of a clearly defined verifiable core standard with clear benchmarks and indicators that ensures the humanitarian sector is more accountable to affected populations and that organisations are more effective. The second area is around verification. To complement the work on the core standard, to ensure that humanitarian actors understand how standards can be assessed and verified and how verification tools can be applied to the core standard. This is likely to generate some guidance on verification tools and is limited in scope because the anticip to we anticipate that SCHR certification review will be pressing much further and deeper into this issue over the next 18 months. The third area is around the dissemination of the standard to ensure greater adoption of the new core standard by field workers and greater institutionalisation of the standard by agencies, deliver better awareness raising and training. And the fourth area is around standards architecture. To consult on, develop and recommend a new standards architecture with humanitarian principles at the very heart in order to support and better support aid workers and agencies to to improve humanitarian action and practice. Standards architecture, architecture equals organisations involved in standard setting and standards themselves are recognisably part of an overall and coherent structure. That is to help use, is, users navigate the different standards more easily. We cannot do this work without the wider humanitarian community, so please engage with us over the coming months. We will be presenting our decisions in more detail at the Humanitarian Standards Forum, Forum in Geneva next week. And one of the main purposes of this meeting of 200 plus humanitarians is to engage with NGOs, Red Cross, UN, Q&A initiatives, Global South, and many more. But, uh, the important component of the whole standards initiative is around people at the center. It was heartening to hear through the consultation that disaster affected people must be at the very centre of all we do all the time to develop a harmonised standard that is absolutely right for us. Our endeavour will stand or fall on our, our success at meaningfully involving affected people in the evolution of standards. And just to finish, there is a difference, um, which I'm sure Philip, Philip will say in a minute around the work the SHR certification review is doing and JSI, although we have been working closely. They are complementary but separate initiatives. Complementary in that we both have similar missions to improve the quality and accountability of humanitarian action, but different and separate in that the JSI focus has been on standards and how to be more coherent. We have sought to ensure that one process was informing the other to avoid the frequent mistake of overlapping initiatives ignoring each other. We are very conscious that the SHR certification review is considering potential criteria for verifying agencies' compliance with a standard. And we are keen to offer the output of our work on developing a core standard to the review. Thank you. <coughs>